Give us wisdom to guide our action and motivate our spirit to show your awesome power and fill our hearts with your love. We ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I also want to wish you a wonderful good morning. It is, it is a good morning, and we did need the rain, and I'm so glad we got some, too. It's good to see you here this morning. Um, just a couple of things. I don't know how many of you can hear Ron when he rings the bell in the morning. He rings that bell 12 times, and I think that bell means just the world to me. I've told you that before. I've listened to that bell for 75 years, and it just, I can remember my brother, lifted me up so I could, and I want to ring the bell too. And he would lift me up so I could ring the bell and reach the rope. I just, certain things, you know, just, just grab you. It just really grab hold of you. And I just love the sound of that bell going out over the neighborhood. And a witness, it's a witness. We're here. We're worshiping. Come join us. We're here. I just love it. Our Easter garden is starting to fade just a tiny bit. So I know I left my flowers here, as many of you did, but they do need to go home now. They're, they're becoming a little brain so they're torn down, whatever you want to say, but, but they need to go home now. So thank you all for your stuff and brought them, but they've been very, very beautiful. We do have a noisy bucket today. It's back, our noisy bucket is back by the offering. Um, following services, we do have an SPR meeting. Uh, those of you that are on that committee, please do stay for a little bit following service this morning. We do have that meeting. Um, like every Wednesday morning, Pastor leads a Bible service, a Bible study down at Leo's at 6 a.m. And so all are welcome, all are welcome to join in that Bible study. Does anyone else have an announcement this morning? Okay. As we stand to pass the peace, let's remember to wave back to the camera and <laughs> wave to our friends that are joining us online. Let's remember to do that. And let's pass the peace. <laughs> Him, for he acknowledges my name. 
He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With a long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Let's join together in our song this morning. <coughs> Blessed be the time that binds.
church this morning? Does anybody have a joy they'd like to share? I have a joy. Yes. Ron's good buddy, Mike Kennedy, mm -hmm. went to the surgery design this week. He has a steel rod and he tripped his ankle. Complete leg. And he's up and walking. We had it three days ago. wanted me to let you know that Buddy B, they have called hospice in for him. So. Thank you for that. Jennifer Creel, and our update on Bud, Buddy, um, Dick and Mary Fletcher, Ron Huffer, Jasmine Jackson, Uh, surgery is Monday. Surgery is Monday. Thank you. Joyce Kling, Shirley Kling, Ralph and Mary Kiffelwood, Daryl Judy Grover, Tommy Metcalf, Marilyn Miller, and I'll have more on that in just a minute, Mike Welsh, our schools, our country, and our churches. And this one is from my mom, Cindy. They admitted her sister yesterday at Memorial Hospital. Her name is Amy. Um, she has congestive heart failure which is kind of a surprise. Um, so my dad and Cindy will probably be coming home fairly quick from Florida as soon as they can find a flight. Um, apparently all the other snowbirds are also leaving Florida at the same time. <clears throat> um, prayer list. Marilyn Miller, this is a unique situation. Um, <coughs> I work in a public school system, so profession of your faith is... Uh, not uh, what we call verbalized a lot of times. Um, but with teachers in my building, they know that I am a very active church member. They know that I'm a pastor. The reason why they know these things is because I have stuff all over my office that says wise. That is the one thing that as a public school teacher you, that you are allowed the freedom of, and that is your workspace. So I use it a lot. Sayings on the wall, pictures, crosses, uh, 
centerpieces from working past weekends. I've got my Bible laying out on my desk <laughs> for everybody to see. I don't ever say a word about it. I just leave it later. So, uh, Monday evening, Tuesday evening, Monday, Tuesday evening, I can't remember exactly which day, one of the teachers in my building that I talk to every single day, um, she's a young teacher. Uh, she's been teaching for, I don't know, two or three years. She's probably mid-25, mid 30, 26, 27, something like that. Um, she came into my office and she just looked at me and she goes, can you do me a favor? I said, sure. Could you put your, could you put my mom on your prayer list? And I said, absolutely. What's her name? And I sent it to Karen so that we could get it on the list today. That's the only time she's ever really approached me about religious stuff. So I don't know that I've had a breakthrough there. Um, but... In that event, I've got her mom on the prayer list, and we are going to pray for her. Um, and hopefully, this uh, blossoms into something new. So it's pretty exciting for me. So with that, if we can bow our heads, let's go right to the Lord's prayer as He taught us to pray. Pastor, Pastor yes, sir. Um, I was outside here when you're going through the concerns. My sister ended up in the hospital again last week. We went to a different hospital, though. But anyway. She ended up with a seizure, and it took three EMTs to hold her down. Anybody knows her knows she's small, mm -hmm. and so they put her on <clears throat> anti-seizure medication. And I haven't got an update on what's going on. But at least she had something they could dig into. You know, seizures uh, um, for that kind of seizure. Is unfortunate, but <clears throat> it might lead us into the doorway of yep. fixing things, which is <clears throat> for. Thanks for the update. Thank you. And with that, we <clears throat> our hands in prayer that the prayer of the Father taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us for our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
what's happening with me anyway. I had my first decom meeting yesterday, which I don't know if you know what that process actually involves, but when you will become a uh, appointed pastor, which is what I am, um, you basically sign up for pastoral school, uh, lack of a better word. Um, and a part of that is a decom meeting that has to happen twice a year. So I had my very first one yesterday. Um, and the two pastors that were on my uh, decom committee asked me a question. And they said, how do you know that you are in the right place? I went, hmm. that's interesting. I said, well, I can tell you how I know. I said, because the folks here at this church have welcomed me with open arms are so warm and loving and inviting. So that was definitely a bonus for me. And I said, being piety to my pianist. Because my love of music is drives deep in me, and to hear that quality of play every single Sunday is a blessing. So that's how I know that I'm in the right place. <clears throat> so with that, I'm going to lead us right into the second scripture today. It is from the book of Mark, chapter 10, verses 35 through 45, NIV translation. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. That's a tricky question. What do you want from me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptizing with you? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with, but to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those whom they have been prepared when the ten had heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord over them and their officials exercise authority over them. Do so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. <laughs> And whoever wants to be first must be a slave to all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to be and to give his life as a ransom for many. Which leads me right into my sermon today. The sermon is titled. John Mark. Like I mentioned a few months ago, I want to do a sermon based on an individual from the Bible. So today, we're doing one on John Mark. Now, who is John Mark? Well, John Mark, a.k.a. Mark, is the author of the Gospel of Mark. Now, that was something that I had to learn when I'm doing my studies. I did not realize that his first name was John. So I found that very interesting. The other thing that I found interesting, and this is something that's always kind of stuck out to me about biblical reading, <clears throat> are the names. And in this case, John Mark is more than the gospel writer of Mark. When you look at his name, it does have a particular meaning. John, which is Yahweh, is gracious. That's Hebrew. Which points to his Jewish heritage. Whereas Mark, on the other hand, is a common Greek name from the Latin word or name of Marcus. Now, typically, when you have two names, like John Mark, you're probably a Roman citizen. Also, two names may indicate in a previous life 
that you were possibly a slave of a Roman family. There is no clear evidence that John Mark was a slave, but based on other evidence, he probably wasn't a slave, but more likely a Roman citizen. In the book of Acts, chapter 12, verse 12 and 13, when this had drawn upon him, he went to the house of Mary, mother of John. Now, when you read that, you're probably thinking another John. But in actuality, it's John Mark. Also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhonda to answer the door. Now, what can we conclude from this house? Well, first, it points to a large place. It's housing many people. And two, it had at least one servant, and her name was Rhonda. So, based on these two things, you can conclude this house was large enough to have a servant and was able to accommodate many visitors. So just these two facts alone can point to John Mark as being someone of stature, wealth, and more than likely a Roman citizen. And here's the interesting fact here. John Mark's mother's name No, it's not the Mary that you're thinking of, but a Mary. More than likely, they started life out <clears throat> as someone of wealth or married into someone of a wealthy stature. It's not common that they would have been slaves and worked their way up to the stature that they currently hold. This was something that was interesting to learn during this research was that John Mark was actually a cousin of Barnabas. And in the book of Colossians, chapter 4, verse 10, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. So here in Scripture, we're referring to the same person with two different names. That's something that I've always kind of tricked over when I'm reading the Bible, is who is this person and how do they belong to this and how does this all meet together? That's always been something that's kind of tricked me up. But as I study the Bible and become more attuned with what's happening in the Bible, I can kind of see how all these things fit together. So it's part of that study aspect. This also adds to the fact that Paul and Martyr was set out on their first missionary journey with Mark or a.k.a. John Mark, as their assistant. And how do we know this? Well, it was supported by Luke. And from Luke, chapter 1, verse 2, just as many were handed down to us, those whom from the first were eyewitnesses to the servants of the word. Whereas Paul and Barnabas were great missionaries, Mark was that assistant in documenting all of that happened. Something else I learned about John Mark is he left the two senior men in Perga. Now, this is the first missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas, and for some reason, he left them. So in the book of Acts, chapter 13, verse 13b, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. It doesn't say John Mark. It doesn't say Mark. It just says John. So again, here we are in Scripture, referring to the same individual with a different name. So this fact alone, John Mark was a person who had or does have direct relationships with Paul and Barnabas, the very first Jewish leaders of the Christian church. A witness to the first missionaries of the early church. 
This seemingly makes sense because, if you recall from an earlier notes of John Mark's mother's house, was more than likely filling the role of church during this time period. Now that's pretty astonishing. So we don't really know a lot about Mark other than what we read from the Bible, but when you put the pieces together, you can see how he is an integral part of what is happening. And as we go on through this, I'm going to point out some other things that make me go, hmm. Now I'll be the first to admit that reading the Bible does create some confusion because of the name thing. So we have two names of individuals. Sometimes they're called by their given name. Sometimes they're called by their makeshift name. But it does create some confusion. But when you sit down and study the Bible, you can make sense of this reading. By going back through and noting relationships and references between Bibles and books, this alone is the reason that I feel reading and studying your Bible is so important. And I can't stress that enough. Because when you study Scripture, it really sticks out to you. Does this take special training? Someone asked me one time. Does it take special training to study the Bible? I'm well, sure it does. It takes clear back into grade school when it tells you how to read. Right? This is one of the things as a public school teacher that just makes me just want to spit fire sometimes. Is back in the old adages of, of our civilization here. We were taught to read the Bible as one of our very first books. Now think about that. Back in the 17 and 1800s, when we were teaching in those one-room schools, the only book that we really had available to us was our biblical books, or the Bible. But now, we have our kids learning how to read about hobbits, magicians, dinosaurs, <laughs> and we totally forget about the Bible. That just frustrates me. But what it does do, that special training that I talked about, it does take your time. Now, reading the Bible sometimes can be a little bit of a drawn-out process because you have to do a little research, you have to do a little investigating, so it does take time. But, here's the important thing that I've discovered. Time spent in God's Word and uncovering what God opens to your eyes is well worth the investment. Now, let's get down to the business of facts. I like to think of facts as what I call, and I share this quite often, indisputable evidence. What does that mean? That means you can't argue with it. It's fact. So, an example going back to my machinist days about rounding up. I was taught long ago that we don't round up. If you're taught that in school, that's okay. But when you're a machinist, it's not 375 thousandths. It's actually 374 thousandths and five tenths. That's exactly what it is. So we don't round it up. So that's indisputable evidence. What is the indisputable evidence about Mark? Well, the Gospel of Mark was written probably between AD 55 and 65. Now, what does that mean to you? Well, that means about 20 years after Jesus' crucifixion is when he wrote down his evidence. Now, is that in time enough to remember everything that has happened? Maybe. Maybe not. The second thing, this is the short, excuse me, the gospel is the shortest of the four. Now, you probably don't find much amazement in that until I read some more. It was also written in the most chronological order. So when you do read the book of Mark, it does fall out in chronological order. Unlike the other Gospels, kind of tend to jump around a little bit. It 
It contains the most events documented on Jesus' ministry. It also record, records the most miracles of any of the Gospels. So I found that very interesting. And this one probably sticks out more than all. Based on all the verses that are quoted, and when I'm talking about all the verses, all but 31 of the book of Mark are quoted by the other three Gospels. Now what does that tell you if you read that? That tells you that that suggests that Mark was actually the very first Gospel. And the other three came after. He was a close companion three of the early Christian leaders. Barnabas, Paul, and this one most people forget about, and that's Peter. Peter being the only one of the three that was actually one of the original twelve disciples. Now, for some more evidence that supports that John Mark was an early disciple of Jesus. Not one of the early 12 disciples, but a disciple, who may have been a direct, indirect presence of Jesus. Now you have to read this, I'm gonna repeat this twice so we get this understanding here. From the book of Mark, chapter 14, verses 51 through 52. A young man, wearing nothing but a linen garment, was following Jesus. Now, when is this taking place? This is taking place in the garden right before the authorities come to arrest Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. I'll read it again. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. Then they seized him. He fled naked. Now, it doesn't give us a name here. It's not noted anywhere else in Mark who that person actually was. But there is some evidence that may support who it actually was. It is widely believed that the young man that fled was John Mark. Now, what's my first piece of evidence to this? Well, this. It was customary for authors of books of that time not to mention their own names in their writings. So I find it interesting that their author here notes that someone fled a particular event in time, but didn't know the name of the person that fled. But yet it's customary in that time frame that when you are an author of something, you don't mention your own name. So that's one piece that might support it. There's a further supporting of this factual evidence of the falling out of Paul and John Mark during that first missionary trip, where John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. So you could possibly look at that as fleeing. Now, let's take into account here what's actually happening. Jesus has been crucified. The church as we know it, the Christian church, is very, very young. Pagan worship is the primary form of religious <coughs> activities. So here you have two individuals. They don't have an army. They don't have a country. They don't have a mass following with them. Are traveling around this pagan area. And we call it the Mediterranean, you know, Israel, Jordan, Turkey. Greece, Rome, that kind of that kind of area we're talking about here, and they're preaching the good news. Now, do you think it's all just flowers and fireworks, and everybody's having a good time and big banquets, and it's all good, or are they seeing some struggles? Are people maybe not treating them so nicely? Maybe. 
Is that possible? By what I read in the Bible, I, I think that's extremely possible. So we'll go back to that original statement. When Jesus was being arrested, the young man fled. See, I teach that very same thing in my classroom. I call it fail. Right? And of course, students, you know, they get kind of laugh and chuckle about it and think it's funny. But I write it on the board vertically. They go, why do you do it like that? I said, because fail is actually an acronym. They go, is? Yes. What does it mean? I said, well, what does, what does fail mean? Fail means. You're going to fail. Get your head wrapped around. It's going to happen. Now, the important thing is, what did you learn? This is a great example of Mark. Did or was Mark in the garden with Jesus? Don't know. There's no factual evidence that says, yes, he was. But there are some actions that suggest it is Mark. And this would have been the time when Mark would have been very, very young. So he faced adversity at difficult times and challenge. And what did he do? He ran. And he didn't run with his clothes on. He was naked. And how do we know this? What supports this? Well, when he goes to that missionary trip with Paul and Barnabas, they have some difficulty, I'm sure of it. And what does he do? He flees. Now, at that time, Mark would have been, again, a young adult. So still learning. And this is what I learn when I read from Mark. So staying persistent beyond your mistakes will build your and eventually repair anything broke in past choices. And the 
one thing that I find so impactful from the book of Mark, and of course I've already read it to you, and that is chapter 10, verse 45, where even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And just on a side note, stand. We have one more hymnal. That is My Hope Is Built 368.
Yeah. 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 Yeah.